everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. In 2011, director producer Jason Reitman teamed up with Diablo Cody and Charlize Theron with Young Adult, the very funny story of a broken, depressed, self-centered woman unable to cope with adulthood. Well, the gang's gotten back together, this time for a very funny, slightly more sympathetic portrait of a woman who did grow up, became a mother, but is struggling to wrap her head around who she is while her life is centered around everyone but herself. Let's take a look at the trailer for Tully. No, no, no! Do you know what a night nanny is? They take care of the baby at night so mom and dad can get some sleep. I don't want a stranger in my house. It's like a Lifetime movie where the nanny tries to kill the family and the mom survives and she has to walk with a cane at the end. Get over yourself. Mom, what's wrong with your body? Hello. I'm Telly. I'm here to take care of you. I'm just not used to people doing things for me. I hold a baby all day, and then nighttime rolls around, and I'm supposed to just switch gears. Like, hello, I'm all sexy now. You're empty. Yeah. No, you're empty on this side. <sighs> Your 20s are great. But then your 30s come around the corner like a garbage truck at 5 a.m. Girls heal. No, we don't. We might look like we're all better, but if you look close, we're covered in concealer. You're convinced that you're this failure, but you actually made your biggest dream come true. If you want to run off or something, I get that. Because I want to do that too sometimes, but I'm not going to. Help you with everything. You can't fix the parts without treating the whole. Yeah, no one's treated my whole in a really long time. <laughs> Everybody, please welcome Ron Levinson, Mackenzie Davis, and Jason Reitman. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Congratulations on, on the movie, a film that I loved. I think it's one of the best that I've seen this year. It's really empathetic and beautiful and, and really funny and filled with incredible performances. And uh, I think one of the, you're, you're a fantastic director and one of the ways that you're such a wonderful director is that you have a, I hope you, hope you like this compliment, a light touch. <laughs> you never Thank feel you. like you're- I was more wondering where, okay, he's going nice. What's on the other side of this sentence? Yeah. However, <laughs> However, every now and then, Jason, no, uh, you have a very, you don't ever seem like you want to show off that you're directing a movie. You seem very concerned mostly with the story and the actors and making sure that all of that stuff lands. I never feel like I'm watching someone who wants to showcase their, their talents. But everything is very, it takes a lot of talent to make. I think, Did honestly, uh, perfectly. Uh, I think it's, Done. it's growing up, frankly. You know, I think we're all showier when we're younger. And I mean, when I made Thank You for Smoking, uh, I, I look at that now and I see a director desperately showing off every camera move he has, you know, in the holster. And what I've been trying to do with each progressive film is take my hands off the camera more. I, you know, I'd be much happier if you just forgot about the presence of the director and were lost in it. Is that you just loving to work with actors and sort of focusing on that mostly? I think I just fell in love with movies where the director was disappearing. Uh, and, uh, and I do, I guess, get lost more in the character journey uh, when that happens. Is there a director or movie that you looked at going into making this? When you think of directors that get lost and they get lost in the movie. I, it's a great question, and, and frankly, you know, I really connect Tully to the two movies that uh, I've made with Diablo before, Juno and Young Adult, and now this, and I feel like... Um, you know, we started something with Juno, and we've been kind of following that trajectory now. And there's been films that we watched in between each of them. I thought Beginners, the the uh, 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 that beautiful movie from like four years ago. That Mike I, Mills, yeah, the Mike film? Mills film. I love that film, and thought it was kind of perfect, and that was a big influence. But if you know, if I keep on going further back, it'll get back to kind of Harold and Maude. Right. Um, but 
Yeah, I, I think it's more just kind of the directory of those and, you know, using less contrast and getting more into the warmth and really just creating a safe space so that these brilliant actors can be spontaneous. Uh, Ron, I, I was telling you in the green room I had a hard time with, with your character, but you do an amazing job of maintaining a certain amount of empathy so that he doesn't come across as a, as a bad guy, which in a lot of ways is somewhat hard given what he's doing throughout a lot, of the, a lot of the film. Is that something that you thought about going into the performance, or did you just sort of instinctively know that this was a, a good guy and that, that would come across? No, I, I think I was definitely aware of it. We talked about it a little bit. Um, I think the thing that I've latched on to is that there's a difference between uh, having a failure of intention uh, and, and the second of just having a failure of skills, of proficiency. So I wanted to play a guy who really wanted to be a good dad, wanted to be an equal partner, thought he was, and just had no clue uh, how, how much he was dropping the ball. How clueless he was. Yeah. Had no clue how clueless he was. Had no clue how clueless he was. Yeah. Thought he was, you know, we, uh, the metaphor I used was like, a, you know, a set PA who's listening to their walkie, waiting to be told what to do, and he's on the wrong channel. Yeah. I imagine that conversation happening in front of a set PA that's like, is that, are you talking about me? Uh, Mackenzie, your character is, uh, there are so many ways that this could go in terms of someone of whimsy who shows up and is just the solution and is just, uh, doesn't have a three-dimensional life. And you present someone with a three-dimensional life with very little backstory at times. What sort of backstory did you prepare for that character? Did you think about that th those things going into the scene? I mean, I thought about them. I didn't prepare like an extensive, you know, library of her life because I thought so much of the movie was about being really present in the scenes with Charlize and that part of her charm and whimsy, I guess, is that she's like genuinely curious and genuinely investigating and reacts like in the moment without really processing in a really pure way. And that appealed to me so much. So it didn't feel like this world of, of like subtext and motivation Motivations really came in more than just being like extraordinarily present in a way that I don't think a lot of us are. Right, so much of your job is investing in someone who hasn't been invested or doesn't feel like they've been invested in in a, in a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And figuring out why they're doing the way that why they're doing the things that they're doing in the way that they're doing them. And in this, it felt very clear why Tully was doing what she was doing, what she wanted, and and it, it all centered around Marlo, which was such a freeing place to, to occupy. Uh, Jason, when you get a script from Diablo, this is the third movie that the, the, the two of you have worked on together. Yeah. Is this the kind of scenario where she gives you a finished script or are the two of you kind of collaborating and talking about it over the course of her writing it? Uh, no, she, I mean, it's funny. At the beginning, we get a file, she calls me on the phone and uh, this one, she described the movie in two sentences and I said, oh yeah, you got to write that. And then six what weeks the later... the two sentences, if you, don't, do you, if you remember? I can't say them because it gives away well, the movie, yeah, sadly. Okay, yeah. You know, uh, Tully has, uh, Tully's a movie with a, a, real, a really lovely review. <laughs> Reveal. And the movie, it's a movie that unveils itself to you. And it's a movie that you watch it, and then at the end of it, you oddly realize you've been watching two movies at once, but you don't realize that till the end. And so she described it in two sentences, and I said, You gotta write that. And then six weeks later, there was a finished script. She writes in this miraculous way where there's no treatment, there's no index cards. She just walks into the forest and comes out the other side, and not with a first draft like with a shooting draft. That's crazy. It is crazy. And by the way, as a fellow writer, it's infuriating. Uh, like it took me seven years to write Up in the Air. The idea that she could sit down and write something that's really funny and really nuanced and has all these little things that add up, which once you've seen the film, uh, <laughs> will all make sense. And that she can kind of layer these in, in real time as she's writing is mind boggling. There's an amazing punchline at the at the end of the oh ruin it, it please away. I'm not no. going to but I just I loved that I love that you followed up on that pun that on that setup so oh, much because I never I never saw it coming but it's like a, a great movie or play it's like oh this is inevitable that you followed up on this but I completely right. forgot that we would do it yeah I think that's one of the hardest moves to do as a writer yeah. do you know what he's talking about no I want to know oh my god <laughs> the what. Yes. Oh my God! Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 So uh, <laughs> literally, like the definition. Now, do you want to see the movie? <laughs> <laughs> I could have just said, uh, like, 
cheeseburger. Yeah. Uh, so um, it's rarely that a movie can actually do that. It's usually a play yeah. that does that very well. Yeah, and you always know. Usually, when someone's bringing something up uh, early on in the film, uh, it's so obvious. Yes. It's like, oh, I wonder if they're going to need that super secret gun that only works when you're in this one position and it gets radiated by the sun. And like, like some random character that shows up in the first act. And you're like, yeah, that person's going to. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, we haven't actually talked about Charlize yet, who delivers easily one of the best performances of the year. She does what she does so often, which is throws herself completely into something and unexpected and brave. I don't want to say brave. It's kind of a cliche word at this point, but da really daring, challenging ways. What was it like working with her on set? It was amazing. I mean, I think a lot of people have been talking about her lack of vanity in this performance, which I think can be misconstrued to have anything to do with a weight gain or like an right. ability to let herself look and behave a certain way on camera but the lack of vanity was like just being so the character without having any attendant like pyrotechnics to it she just mm. she just was this woman and didn't demand um in her behavior or anything she's just so unprecious about what she does she's so good at what she does and with such an intent that requires nobody else to be like you're doing so great like she's yeah. just a wonderful actress in in her core I mean, yeah, it's somebody that it, when you're watching her during the take, you, you miss a lot of it, and then you see it on screen, and you and then you're like, oh my god, there was that in there, there was that in there, but it's not, uh, it, she's not precious about it. Uh, she just kind of uh, dives in. Uh, that's something I actually strangely feel about all three of you, and I don't feel this about every actor, but you're all subtle actors who are always doing subtle, nuanced things that, as a director, I get to editing and go, oh, and I, like suddenly all these little things that you do language-wise and that you do with your face, uh, uh, they feel like little gifts in the editing room. But I feel like that, that's not something that you know, go, you know going into casting because so much of this film feels based around those little little quirks and the, and the moments in between the lines at times. Right. I mean, going into casting, I find that what you're looking for is chemistry and magic. And, uh, you know, what, like if there was a kind of a, a key thing about Mackenzie that I knew was uh, important to this role was this kind of vast sense of curiosity that is just kind of in her DNA. Uh, it, it, you know, everywhere, you know, I see you looking around, there's this kind of intelligence and curiosity in your eyes that's picking up the world. And I knew that in Marlo, Charlize is playing a character who feels like no one's looking at her anymore. And this young woman walks in and is just fascinated by her. And in Ron, there's just this overwhelming sense of decency to Ron Livingston mm -hmm. uh, that makes him so lovable. <laughs> and he's uh, one of my favorite people to be out with in public because just people see him and their only association with him is like loveliness. They just kind of smile when they see him. <laughs> and and you're right, it's a tricky role in that it's a cold marriage and and you feel them having gone quiet. And we he's don't- He's good. Exactly, we, don't, we good. don't wanna dislike him. And I knew that with Ron, his DNA brings us 50% there because his decency echoes through the character. Now, those scenes where he's sitting in the bed and he's, he's, he's playing video games, when those scenes started, I was like, you motherfucker. And then Wait, we can say motherfucker yeah. on this? Yeah. We need to start over. Okay. <laughs> Guys, we're going back. <laughs> then halfway through the scene, when you look up, I'm like, oh, no, he's, he's a good guy. I, I, I get this. You know, I, you, you are right that there's all it takes is a look to kind of get you there with, with Ron to be like, oh, he's not a bad guy. I mean, I brought this up with Diablo upon first reading the script. I said, are you worried about people disliking this character? And she said... I think a lot of moms will recognize that portrait of a husband on screen. I mean, she, 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 and by the way, so far she's been accurate. And now this is the uh, second time that you've worked with, with Charlize, right? Yeah. After a uh, young adult, what kind of conversations do the two of you have before shooting going into this? Uh, they're all about realism. They're all about how do we make her feel so accurate and authentic that the audience sees themselves on screen? So they become about her hair, they become about her clothes, they become about the way she walks. We look at the dialogue and see if there's anything that feels like uh, that's untrue for us. And that's the majority of it, but we don't rehearse. You know, uh, I've always felt like, yeah, I feel like um, in theater you have, to, you have to prepare something that's gonna be done every night on stage. On, in movies, you're looking for one moment it's one magical moment that happens on one take, 
And if that were to happen in rehearsal while the camera wasn't running, I, I can't imagine anything more heartbreaking. So I cast actors that I trust. I know how gifted they are. I have a sense of what kind of chemistry they're gonna have. And whether it happens on take two or take eight, the moment that it happens, the camera needs to be rolling. Does it also help that you have a script that is so locked and figured out as well going into those scenes in the sense that like yeah. all the information is kind of there to tell the story? It, it does. However, Diablo Cody's scripts are tough. They're not easy. The language is unusual. It's not the type of script where I think an actor goes, oh, I've said this a million times. Yeah. You have to go, okay, I've never said this. I've never said it in quite this way. How am I, am I gonna make it real? And over the course of three films, I'm really lucky that between Ellen Page and Michael Cera and Patton Oswalt and the cast of this film, uh, I've been able to find actors that can wrap their kind of mouths around tricky dialogue that is a bit unusual and make it sound real and make it funny. I would argue that her dialogue has gotten, I think, more real, more natural mm -hmm. since, since Juno a would, little bit. Do you think that part of that is because Juno was about teenagers, though? Probably. Because like, like, like Juno was about teenagers, so the, uh, uh, in doing teenage speak, you are going to have to use more slang and lingo. And then in young adult, you have an adult who still kind of wants to be a teenager. Right. Anyways. Yeah, my only prep work for Charlize, I'm not sure if I ever told you guys, on young adult, was I sent her season one of Laguna Beach and the Hills. And I said, this is it. This is your research. Watch these shows. Oh, speaking of which, reality TV plays a bit of a role in, in this film. Were, was that written into the script, or was that were those shows that you I'm going to toss this to Mackenzie. Oh, yeah. It was. It actually initially was Cat House. Uh, yeah. We couldn't get the rights to Cat House. Really? Yeah, you know the HBO show about the... the the Jigglos for ladies. Yeah, kind of, but it's like, I mean, it's like one of those real HBO shows, like Real Sex and all of those, right? Yeah, yeah but Cat, Cat House is... Is it about a brothel? Uh, it's about a brothel, and that we couldn't get, like, like there's like certain Nevada, characters right? we couldn't get the rights like, to. Like, you mean, don't know a, about Cat yeah. House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell Come me on. really this nice. Thing, right? <laughs> uh, but Jigglos, they were, like, all in. They're like, yeah, we're game. And it's, a, they were. it's an oddly great show. And it's a great show. And it revealed. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see it in the script? You're like, I'm going on a binge. Yeah, I was like, what's this? And then I was like, I'm all in. <laughs> um, no, I'd never, I'd never watched it before. I love it. I think, I, I just think that using it as a device to show somebody's like true way of taking care of themselves versus how they want to be perceived mm. and how like invasive it can feel to have somebody see what you do in pro like it's, mm -hmm. it's like masturbating and or something. It's something exactly that's what like, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's so private. And to see someone sit there and then the silence just to be between you while this young lady is getting spanked is such a, it's a, it's such a lovely soundtrack. It's like a discomfort. version of lethargy masturbation, right? Yeah. That you wouldn't want anyone to know because it's not even like, if you show someone what you masturbate to, to yeah. it's at least you're do that's like something that you're actively doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With that, it's like, this is something I just lay back and eat bad food and watch <laughs> and, get, and deal with my sad, or don't deal with my sadness while yeah, it's I on. I only sit in ob at an obtuse angle at this point. Like, the you worst of you. Yeah. Feel like this. Yeah, it's the, the peop that people self-medicate with some really weird shit. Yeah. yeah. What do you self-medicate with? Uh, with me, I think it's like, uh, like go down the rabbit hole on on either Reddit or I'll sit down and I'll sit down and play the piano. Oh, that's uh, actually nice, Ron. Yeah, that one's healthy, so nice. but I had to I had to work very hard to steer it towards that. You said you a beautiful thing. Yeah. You started with Reddit, and you're like, no, no, piano. I play piano. I don't go on Reddit. I don't go down Reddit rabbit. Hole. People are gonna see this, Ron. Do you have? I mean, it's kind of a guilty pleasure conversation. What would you say your guilty pleasures are when you're when when you're? It doesn't have oh, to be the guiltiest. You're of pleasures. about to dislike me, though. Why? I have many. I know, but we've, uh, as briefly as you and I have known each other. <laughs> no, I like video games. Oh, oh, that's right. I know. I, 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 I know. You, and you hate gamers. Uh, but, uh, oh, like, I, I will. <laughs> and I knew that's why you gave me that look as soon as uh, I said it. I was it. like, oh, man. Like you got a, a, a slight smile on your face up here, but in the green room, when I was like, I don't like video games, you're like, oh, yeah? Uh -oh. oh, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, like, yeah, like, if it's late at night and I feel like the world's caving in, I will go and kill zombies as long as I need to. Really? Do you think Diablo wrote that for you, knowing that you do that? I don't think she knows that about me. <laughs> <laughs> I like, um... 
I like the whole Bachelor franchise and all of its spinoffs. <laughs> and I like, um, I like Top Chef as well, yeah. You in America is guilty, like all I of America. It's not a place. unique one. But I mean, I know everything about the people who've been on it for like 10 years. Do you really? <laughs> I know so much. Really? Yeah. Is there a good one to start with if I've never oh, watched Oh, Caitlin it Season. It's wonderful. Which one? Caitlin Season. Caitlin? Yeah, Caitlin's a Canadian girl. I hope she sees it. Oh, uh, okay. Now I'm in. All right. <laughs> And she's it's a bachelorette. Really fun. Yeah, she's a bachelorette, and she kind of broke the mold a bit and just had, like, a fun fucking time on The Bachelorette. And you can tell. Hmm. Jason, uh, you might not be able to answer this question because of the uh, what takes place in this film, but what was the most difficult scene for you to direct and kind of get your head around in, in this movie? Uh, I mean, look, uh, the most intimidating thing going in were the children, is that there's going to be an 8-year-old girl, a 5-year-old boy, and a newborn baby. And uh, and that's just complicated because you can have adult conversations with adult actors about this is the meaning of the scene or maybe you should try this. And you can't really do that with kids. The kids, um, you have to inspire an emotion into them and hope that it just rolls the right way. And with babies, it's even trickier because um, you only have a couple hours a day that you can shoot with a baby. And this is a movie where Marlo has a baby on her almost all the time. And you can use like fake doll babies, which are weird. They like, they show up in a box, which is the strangest part. You open like a box and there's a realistic <laughs> baby just kind of sitting there. Um, but the, the scene, for whatever reason, never comes to life when you're using a doll. And I've seen this in other movies, too. Sniper, specifically? Uh, American yeah. Sniper Baby. Like, we did not want to wind up in that. And, uh, and when there's a real baby... The cast change, the crew change, everyone gets quiet. And there's this kind of intimacy that comes and people kind of start to get closer to each other. And so we needed to find a way to shoot within that tiny cycle that we would have between the two twin babies. There's a great uh, joke in the film, the, the Cindy Lauper album, Driving Into the City, yeah. that is simply about how long it takes to get from the yeah, city yeah, to yeah, the yeah. state. Because nobody realizes that it's a much longer drive than it right. actually, you start and you're like, oh, this is going to be fun. We'll go into the city or we'll go upstate. Mm -hmm. And it's like much longer. Was that in the, in the script as well, specifically to that album? No, it was not in the script. We, we wanted to construct a device that would tell you exactly, all right, it's going to take them about an hour to get from Rye to the city. Um, and how do we tell that period of time? And we thought of this, oh, we'll play an album. What's an album? And we thought, oh, well, this Cindy Lauper album. Everybody knows every track on this album. Uh, but of course, we needed to get Cindy Lauper on board. And so we showed her the movie, and she really dug it. And I sat down with her, like a four hour lunch with her, talked about everything, talked about parenting, talked about the movie, really gone. It was like an amazing lunch. And at the end of it, she called her record company and said, I really want this to happen and pushed them to give it to us for a price. Did you have a backup if, if she said no, considering you had to like go through that? Yes, we did. Uh, Appetite for destruction? Uh, oh my God, that would have been mine. Like if it was my story, 100%. Are you kidding me? I was the perfect age for Appetite for Destruction. Uh, I got my Appetite for Destruction, sorry, tape. Uh, uh, when my dad had just made like Ghostbusters 2 and we were touring Japan with that movie and my first, like it was a... Japanese cassette of Appetite for Destruction. It was so cool. Sorry. <laughs> That's great. Mm -hmm. uh, for, let's get a question from the audience. Here's a question right here. Uh, what were the biggest challenges of making the movie for all of you? Uh, any memorable moments also? I feel like it, it was a lovely shoot, but it was a shoot that had lots of challenges. Um, I, and I don't remember what they were. <laughs> but it was, you know, I think working with the the babies was a, both a challenge and a, a blessing, as Jason already talked about. Shooting some of the underwater stuff oh. um, was not a good day. Charlize was really sick, and like in that car, I don't know. It was just a hard, a hard thing. Um, my, <laughs> but yeah, figuring out the characters through the costumes was a, a real challenge. Um, but it all got there. Why, so. is, why is that? The costumes. I don't know. I think making her feel um, 
authentic and not like a version of a cool girl yeah. in the way that you see in every movie and not just like, yeah, maybe she has black eyeliner, but it's not like, like I, there, I, there's just a version of an alt girl that I am repelled by and I was really concerned with that and I, Jason was as well. And um, and yeah, it just took a while to, to figure out who Especially she was exactly. Coming from Halt and Catch Fire where you're kind of playing a, a, an alt girl in that as well a lot of the time. Yeah, and, but I mean, even in that, I think we work, tried though. to make it not like... And I mean, hopefully we succeeded that she wasn't like every alt girl that you've ever seen before. Right. You know, it's just finding like and, and it's hard because all of our references come from movies most of the time. So it's music like, videos. Yeah. And it's hard to mm. figure out who this person is without copying a well-worn image. Mm. Yeah, I think there was a there was a challenge in tracking because there's a movie that uh, you're watching and then there's the movie that you realize you're watching at the end. Mm. And. All of the all of the scenes, all of the actions have to make sense in both movies. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a little bit of a math puzzle of like, okay, this well that would work for this version, but it wouldn't work for that version. So how do I find something that's interesting right. uh, that plays both ways? Mm -hmm. Next question. Um, I was just wondering what it was like to work with Diablo Cody on this film as compared to the other two that you worked on with her. Uh, so, I, and I should start by saying. Our process is very much, she writes the script, she passes the baton, and I go and direct it. And uh, there's not a ton of interaction in the making, which is so strange. Because uh, we're in post? Like, she has such an authorial, author, authorial no, voice. No, like, I remember the first time I showed her Juno, and uh, it was finished, and she came with her parents. And we had a sofa in the editing room, and she sat on the sofa in between her mom and her dad, and they held hands and they watched the movie, and they were all crying at the end. And it was just, it was so intense, it's so beautiful to watch. Um, so, you know, that is our experience. You know, we're, we're basically the same age, and although we grew up in different places and had different lives, there's this strange continuity between the two of us, where we're often thinking and feeling and worried about the same things, only, I don't know how to put them into words, and she can articulate it in a way that no one else can. And I'm just the lucky guy who met her, you know? And uh, when she sees the movie, at least what she tells me is, that's what I was thinking. And even things like in Young Adult, that like cassette tape, uh, she wrote about it in the script, and I knew exactly what Memorex cassette tape she was talking about, and she saw it in the film. I was like, that's the tape. I was like, yeah, I know. Um, so it's... Only different in that I didn't know her when she wrote Juno. You know, when she wrote Juno, she was working at an office in Minneapolis and was going to Target on her breaks and writing Juno in the, in I think either the Starbucks or the McDonald's of the Target, and that's where she wrote it. Ten, you know, ten minutes at a time. And by this one, I knew her, so we could talk about what she was interested in writing next and. And then she'd go off and write it. But she, there's something purist about the way that she writes. I don't think any, anyone interrupts it. Next question. This is for Ron and Mackenzie, and also for Jason as well. You've played a lot of different roles, obviously, in The Martian. And for Ron, my favorite series, Band of Brothers, which still doesn't get the press it deserves. Which is your favorite type of role out of all the ones you've played? And for Jason, if you haven't done this, what type of movie would you like to direct in the future? Uh, that's that's daddy. Daddy's my favorite role. It's uh, it puts all the other ones to shame. Um, I know it's kind of schmaltzy to say that, but it's it's uh, it's so great, and I feel like it it stretches you in so many uh, ways that you never know that you could have been stretched. You played a character named Daddy. No, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> it really Every did take day. me a minute. I was going, Daddy, Dad. Oh, now I know he's talking about being a dad. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's a weird character for Band of Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> so, Sergeant Daddy. <laughs> I was like, it sounds sexy. I know. Wait, what episode of Band of Brothers is that, Ron? <laughs> uh, Mackenzie, what about you? I mean, hard to follow Daddy? father. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think I uh, getting to play different parts all the time is what's exciting. I was really, really happy to play Tully. I never get to play parts like this. This like warm, lovely, supportive, sort of relatively uncomplicated woman was like such a salve. I can never tell how to pronounce that word. Salve? Salve? Salve. salve. Okay. I think salve. I like see it before I say it, so I should stop saying it. Um, 
anyways, yeah, it was so nourishing to me at that time. And then if I played that part too much, I'd crave someone like a character I played in Always Shine, where you get to just go like buck wild and be a total menace to your loved ones. Um, so I like being able to play quite different things as much as possible. You know, uh, I, I don't know. I feel like I'm, I get to make the movies that I want to make. And I feel very fortunate for that. Because uh, when I started, I just, all I dreamt of was being able to be on set for the rest of my life. I grew up on sets because my father's a filmmaker. And uh, uh, by the time I was probably 10 years old or 13 years old, I knew, oh, my God, this is the great. I want to be in the circus life. I want to be in this. I want to you know, show up at locations and watch them unload the trucks and, uh, and, and make movies and tell stories. Like That's, uh, that's what I want to do. So I feel lucky that I get to make movies. And frankly, I get to make the movies that are in my heart. If I look forward to it, it's all the movies I'm going to make with Diablo for the rest of our lives. You know, it's like, I feel like it's a lifelong marriage and we're kind of three chapters into this diary that we're writing together and I can't wait to see what she writes next. And you have a, you have another movie on coming out soon, right? The front runner? Yeah, I'm just editing a movie right now uh, that we shot uh, at the end of last year about Gary Hart's run for the presidency in 88. So you shot this and then you shot this other movie in the midst of editing this or just after? Shot this, edited this, shot front runner, edited that. And uh, and then actually we had a a last second thought on this film and we added a scene. I saw the uh, Tully premiered at Sundance and right after Sundance I had an idea for something I wanted to try. So we loaded Tully into the Avid with Front Runner and there was a moment where we had both movies in the editing bay, which of course you know made me kind of want to create this weird Marvel <laughs> universe where they both exist, but that that didn't happen yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, guys, congratulations on Tully. It's a beautiful film. You did an amazing job. It opens this this weekend, right? Yeah, this comes Friday. Out tomorrow. Comes out tomorrow. Everybody, please give them a round of applause. Let's Thank hear you it. very much.